presentation. We're going to be starting off with Sixty and Dylan. They are going to be giving us or talking to us about the research on the isomerization of cumulone into isocumulone. So let's welcome Sixty and Dylan. <laughs> I'm Dixie Stility. I'm Dylan Walker. And um, we did our project on the isomerization of humulone into isohumulone. Like Sean just said. And so uh, beer has been brewed for hundreds of years, but modern beer has, uh, it's very different from how it used to be brewed. And had the procedures and ingredients have changed a lot. And Mainly, like beer that we know today has hops in it. And that's kind of what characterizes it. And that started around the 14th century to give beer a bitter flavor and to act as a preservative. Okay, so cumulant itself is a compound in hops, the scent that is used. Um, cumulant itself is not very water soluble. And it's made the, the beer that. <laughs> sorry. So the water in the beer, it doesn't, it's the cumulon doesn't go into the beer water, but its isomerized states are more water soluble, so that's why you do get the taste. Um, it isomerizes during the wort boiling, boiling when the beer is made, <laughs> and this was uh, Sharp and Ormrod in 1991 discovered how to isolate cumulon. All right. Um, so. As we said, uh, cumulon isomerizes into isohumulon when you brew beer. And isomerization is when a compound changes into one of its structural isomers. And so it has the same atomic properties, but in a different arrangement. And when cumulon isomerizes, it changes from a six-numbered ring and into a five-numbered ring. And there's two types of isohumulon, uh, cis and trans isohumulon. And um, they are the main cause of the bitter flavor in beer because they are water soluble. And uh, we isolated them using a US patent from 1967. So the chiral molecules, it's chiral because these are changed up here, if you can see. Um, is actually so right here. The difference between these is on this picture, the wedge is the O pointing away towards you, and then the OH, the dashes. That's if you can think about it in a 3D space, that's pointing away from you. And over on this side, those are switched, and these ones are actually staying the same. So they're not in anti-mers of each other. They're called diastereomers, and that's just a type of chiral pair. Uh, the thing about chiral molecules is they rotate polarized plane light differently, so we can actually test that. We test that with optical rotation in a polarimeter. Uh, basically, a polarimeter, what it does is, in here, light is polarized, if you can see on the machine. Then the light is rotated inside the cell with your sample inside. And then finally, the rotation is red. So that gives you a number in degrees, and that just tells you how the light changed inside once it got moved. Um, cumulon has a rotation of negative 212 degrees, grams per milliliter. This isocumulon has 46.7, and trans isocumulon has negative 7.8. Those numbers are important because we can actually look inside the readings we get and see what type of isomers we got. Okay. So we also used uh, HNMR, which is a hydrogen nuclear magnetic resonance instrument. And it's also referred to as a proton, proton NMR because hydrogens are basically just protons. And uh, we use that to basically identify our uh, compounds better to make sure they are what we thought they were. And uh, so the number of splits in a peak cluster it describes the number of adjacent hydrogens, and that's like basically how do you tell what something is. And uh, the number of peaks is one more than the number of attached hydrogens on the neighboring carbon. So uh, yeah, that's pretty much how you tell what the structure of your compound is. 
So to actually get the chemion out of tops, we isolated it. And to do this, we used opaline diamine. Um, we actually used 30.236 grams of hops oil, and that was what we started with. And we added 12 grams of opaline diamine, and then 50 milliliters of benzene. We added that, um, we used that in, we used a nesting, a heat nest, and then we put that in a round bottom and mixed it up until it boiled. Once it was brought to a boil, we had a pre-set up UPIR funnel, which is like the ceramic funnel, and so we used that in an oven and we kept it hot until we were actually ready to transfer it. And then once it started to boil, we added activated charcoal and then we kept it hot and then we moved it immediately over to the vacuum funnel, the vacuum filtration system. And so after that, we filtered it through and then it immediately started to crystallize because it starts to cool down. This helps with purifying it to get out because the benzene will help filter. So once we had crystals, we actually used the crystals to, um, we used benzene on the crystal to pure, further purify it. And so that's how we got our crystals of chimulon. Then the next part is the isolation of chimulon because it's not chimulon inside, you have a crystal complex with opaline diamine. So to do this, we actually took 30 milliliters of six molar hydrochloric acid and we mixed, uh, we use different washing systems, but we also use 15 milliliters of deionized water and 12 molar hydrochloric acid. So we took 1.05 grams of the complex and added with 20 milliliters of ether in a separatory funnel, and then we shook that and vented it, and then 6 milliliters of 6 molar hydrochloric acid was, acid was added to the funnel and shaken and vented. The bottom aqueous layer was what we um, collected, and then we were dealing with the organic layer. We just washed the aqueous layer again to make sure that we got a higher yield of the tumulon. And then after that, we kept washing it with the different solutions I said. And then we actually used a drying agent inside to make sure that we got all the water out. And that was magnesium sulfate. And that was just uh, gravity filtered out. And the organic layer was put inside of a small round bottom box. And then the ether was actually rotovap out of that. This is the rotovap up here. Basically, you put your sample in there, and then you put it under pressure so it makes the boiling temperature lower, and then you can easily evaporate what you need to out of there. And this is actually our separatory funnel setup. This is what we put inside and then added the other. All right, and so after we did that, we um, ran some polarimeter tests. And with that, we did uh, 0.05 grams of humulon with 10 milliliters of DI water um, with a pH of 10. Uh, so, uh, this one we actually used sodium hydroxide. Yes. And uh, so we added drops of that into the DI water to give it a pH of 10. And, uh, because we added the humulon into the eye water, it was diluted. And uh, so it changed the optical rotations to lower numbers so you could actually read it. Because if you have uh, something rotating 212 degrees, it's going to like go all the way around and you can't really tell from that. And so the new optical rotations were negative uh, 1.06 for humulon and uh, 0.2335 for cis isohemulone, negative 0.039 for trans isohemulone, and then we averaged the cis and the trans isohemulone for, uh, to get like an average of what it would be if they uh, isomerized it like equally 50-50, and that was 0.09725. And so we ran that through the polarimeter and we got a negative point, like one eight ish, for our optical rotations because we did more than one test, and that was it's not close to any of the um, expected values for the cis isohumulon or the trans isohumulon or the humulon, and so that was decently inconclusive. But then we did a second polarimeter test, and for that one we. Uh, we So then, because we wanted to make sure that we had i 6 and we wanted to follow a already predetermined patent that we found. And so with this, we took hops, 
Um, we put it under a reef block. Basically, a reef block is just we put a round bottom. We put everything in a round bottom. Then we put that to heat with the condenser on with cold water running through. So when it evaporates, it doesn't leave. It just cools down and falls back. So you can heat up your product or whatever you need to without actually losing it. Then we filtered this. We actually used real hops this time because we tried it before, but that was we couldn't get anything out of it when we tried to get our material. So we used actual hops. The plant, uh, the organic plant material, we think did help. Uh, that's what the isoq loan attached to. So then we filtered that through. We had issues with filtering because of the organic material and it being plant, so it actually got clogged. And so filtering was fun. Then we took what we had from the filtering and we added acid, hoping that it would have a crash. It did. This was really cool to watch. What happened was when we added the hydrochloric acid, we got a precipitate and we took that precipitate because that is what um, you have that material in there and your attached isoquinulin. Then we took this through the extraction process. To do this, we used laboratory funnel with uh, sulfuric acid. And then when we got this through, we had a hexane layer and then we had to extract that. Then we wrote about that, and then we were able to take an HNMR. So this is our humulone, and this is actually known humulone up here. And then this is what we had of our HNMR. So right here is humulone. This is the open ending diamond. And so you can see that the location of the peaks is very similar in the same. So the one here, you can see that over here. What we did see was right here, This we think was our benzene, because that was what we used. That just didn't rotate back all the way off and evaporate. And then this is our chloroform. The solvent we used to get the HNMR was deuterated chloroform, but not all of it was deuterated, so some of it does show up. OK. And so we also took an HNMR in a different solvent just to see if it would um, show the peaks better or not show them really, but so the solvents can overlap with the peaks and we were wanted to make sure that we had the best solvent for what we were testing. And so we took another HMR of our humulone in an acetone solvent. And uh, so this is the one on the right is the acetone one and the one on the left is the chlor the one in deuterated chloroform. And and so this is the known humulone peaks. And if you look on the acetone NMR, you can see that uh, the, the peaks from the acetone are covering some of the humulone peaks. And so from that, we decided that it would be best to keep using the deuterated chloroform because it had fewer impurities. And then, so. Like we said, we took a HNMR of our humulone once we uh, isolated it from the patent, and we compared it to an HNMR we took of what we thought might be the possible isohumulone that we had gotten from the polarimeter test with the ethanol. And so there, our isohumulone HNMR is uh, quite impure and needs more purification. But you can still tell that there are differences in the peaks. And so from that, we concluded that the pop, what we thought was the possible isohumulone was not. And we, thought, we began to think that it was likely an uh, ammonium hydroxide salt complex that formed from the addition of the ethanol and pH buffer with the um, humulone. So what we can conclude is that humulone can be isolated from the process described by Ormerod and Sharp. And that's what we found with our HNMRs in their peaks and the known humulone because the R's did match up. And we can also determine that isohumulone can be isolated if it's further purified to get the hexanes off following the US patent. And then we also discovered that dissolving humulone basic ethanol changes the compound. We don't know exactly how yet. Further testing would need to be done on that. But um, with ammonium hydroxide, it did change immediately. In the sodium hydroxide, it didn't dissolve completely, so that could have skewed our results. But adding the ammonium hydroxide buffer after dissolving it in the ethanol did change it really quickly. And so that we got on our polarimeter, 
So you, that changed instantly and it stayed the same. So further purification is needed in the ISO human loan to get the hexanes out so we can accurately compare the NMOs. We would just love to acknowledge the, all the help we've gotten here at FSI. This is a great program. Our advisor, Sean Hopkins, he's helped us a lot with our revisions. Our mentors, Dr. Mosher and Sean Johnson, they were there in the laboratory. John, Sean Johnson was there with us every day helping us getting through our whatever we needed help with. He was right there helping us. I would like to thank my sponsors for getting me into the program, for paying and helping me get in here. I'm very grateful. Kinder Morgan Foundation for funding my research. Um, Mapleton Education Fund, they helped me get into this program. So did my teachers at school, Ms. Kimberly Adams. Without her, I actually don't think I'd be in this program. She was amazing in helping me in the application process and telling me about the program and getting me excited about STEM in general. And also Ms. Sherry Tengis, my director at my high school. Thank you so much for all you've done and all the help you've given me with financial support of this. And then also I was huge thank you to Sunflower Energy for being my great scholar sponsor. And then of course University of Northern Colorado for giving us your facilities and letting us use your laboratory. And I would also like to thank our advisor Sean and our mentor Sean uh, and my research sponsor Union Pacific for obviously sponsoring my research and my scholar sponsor uh, Adolf Coors Foundation because this has been an amazing experience and without them I would not be able to do it. And I'd also like to thank University of Northern Colorado because Thank you so much. Thank you for the program. Any questions? I have uh, 